Region Regional Advisory Council. My name is Rick Rothstein. I am currently the chair of this regional council, uh, but probably only for a few more minutes. Um, so um, I would say let's start with introductions. Uh, we, I see we have a new 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 member, I guess. So um, Susan, why don't you introduce yourselves? Uh, although you know some of the people here. Um, me, I'm Susan Freehar. I am a mom of Nathaniel Nathaniel Freehar, who is at the Mullen Hill Group Home. Okay, I guess we can go around the rest of the table just so uh, you get to know us a bit. Uh, just state your uh, your situation, yeah, and uh, and so Sue gets to know us a little bit. So uh, shall we start with Donna? Right to left, go around the loop. Hi, I'm Donna Cohen, and uh, my daughter Rachel is 30, and she's home with us. And um, since COVID, we did pull her out of her day program, and um, we self-direct three days a week. She goes to a farm um, five hours a day, and if there is such thing as a farm program and someone wants to share that with me, feel free. Um, I've heard of one, and I went to visit it, but it's an hour away, which is a little much. Um, I know other people don't like the farm thing, but we do. So if there's any info, that'd be great. Okay, Ellen. Hi, I'm Ellen. Um, I'm daughter of Kim and she's on here right now. Um, I have a, in, how do you say it, mom? Intellectual disability? Yes, correct. An intellectual disability. Um, yeah. I need support with. Um, what else you? What what else? I don't. I don't know what I should say. <laughs> You're cool. Oh, how okay. about if I keep going? How's that? Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm and the other half, Ellen. We're currently not. <laughs> we're currently not in the same place right now. So. No, to different places. Yeah. Um, and Ellen is 31. And um, almost yeah. 32. I, almost 32. Almost 32. Almost 32. Right. In April. Yes. Yeah. Um, and I also I work for Creative Living Community of Connecticut, which is based in Coventry, and we work with uh, people with autism and intellectual disabilities. Um, and our ultimate goal is to get them into the community. Um, so that they can work um, with support and we're also building um, a residential community as well. Would that help with Rachel or would that? It would help with a lot of people. <laughs> I was just thinking about that, Donna, when you were talking about the farm stuff, I was just <laughs> thinking about that because we do, we have, um, we're working on a farm stand, plus we have a greenhouse Plus, we have a garden in the back that um, we also raise our own um, produce as well. So, yeah. That is very awesome. Thank you for sharing. I actually was out there. I've been there before, and um, I actually start, sat in on some of the beginning things with the house and all that. So thank you for thinking of us. Lori, uh, we're just going through and introducing everyone since we have a new member. Um, yes, I'm. I'm sorry, I'm a, a few minutes late. Um, I'm Lori Coughlin, and a parent of a young woman with intellectual disabilities, and she's currently in a CRS in West Hartford and doing well. Okay, Claudia. Hi, I'm Claudia Newman. I'm executive secretary for the North Region. Hi, Claudia. Hi. <laughs> and the representative of the Sullingers, Lori. 
Um, I am Tammy Sellinger, and I have two kids, Jody, who is 32, and Brian, who's 29. Both are diagnosed with Fragile X Syndrome. Jody lives with us still, and we self-direct a day program for her, and she volunteers like 10 different places. And Brian is in a group home, which is in West Hartford through JCL, and he's doing good. And Stacy. Um, um, my, my name is Stacy Silva Gordon, and I am the regional director for the North Region for DDS. <clears throat> okay, so this is Rick Rothstein, um, chair of the council, and um, my son is 39 years old. He lives in a Herc group home in West Hartford and goes to the Herc Day program. Uh, he has had a very complex medical life and it continues to this day, always throwing something new at us. And um, I have been involved in advocacy since virtually since Spencer was born and uh, served as the chairman of the board at HARC. And I'm currently secretary of the Council on Developmental Services. So um, staying busy. So Claudia, what's next on the agenda? Um, did you want to have Melissa? And I see Melissa. Do you want to introduce yourself, Melissa? Hi, everyone. My name is Melissa Mills. I am the parent coordinator for the North Central Region for Connecticut Family Support Network, but I'm also the parent of two children with autism spectrum disorder. Um, my daughter is 20, will be 22 in March. Um, she works full time at UConn Health center in Farmington in food service. My son is 18, currently in a transition program um, at Middlesex Transition Academy. Both are doing very well. That's good to hear. So you wear three hats, Melissa. I sure do. So thank you for joining us. Thank you. Um, and then so, I had the open participation for public, but we don't have any. We don't have any public at all. So, <laughs> uh, yeah. feel free to share share information about these meetings with your friends on Facebook or wherever else you socially <laughs> um, communicate. And um, it's always nice <laughs> to have guests and new blood into our group. So, um, moving on. Um, just our usual, then we usually do the legislative updates. Okay. <laughs> um, legislative update is uh, the legislature gaveled into session last week and uh, it's gotten busy. And we are now in what, what I call silly season. Mm -hmm. This is the week or two when bills come out of the woodwork and in the long session, which we're in this year, beginning in January, ending in June, uh, any legislator can put forth a bill. And so uh, a lot of the folks that we've talked to and our, our friends have talked to uh, get an idea and they put forward what's called a concept bill. And a concept bill is basically uh, probably best a stakeholder, a, a, a placeholder. And it's a placeholder because they'll eventually figure out what to do with it. It might not ever go anywhere. It might become the foundation for something that's very, uh, very detailed and applicable to our, our folks. Um, the bills that I've identified so far are in the Public Health Committee and in the Human Services Committee. Uh, decisions as to where a proposed bill goes are made by the leadership of the House or the Senate, depending upon whether the person proposing it is a House member or a Senate member. And there are some very interesting concept bills that are out there. Um, but at this point, all we know is that there are concepts that someone has brought up. Um, 
the committees are starting to have their regular meetings and we'll decide which bills will start moving forward. Um, uh, I'll go through the ones in the Human Services Committee first. There's a bill, Senate Bill 82, proposed by Senator Looney that uh, wants to eliminate the income and asset limits for the what's called the Medical Connect Health Insurance Program for working persons with disabilities. That that is attributable to some very high functioning people, uh, including people with autism, and that essentially allows them to buy into Medicaid. So they they pay a small percentage of their income. Uh, the in income limit right now is seventy five thousand dollars, and they pay a percentage of that so that they are eligible for Medicaid Medicaid services. Uh, so that's interesting. Um, not applicable to probably most of our kids or any of our kids for that matter. Uh, Senate Bill one sixty nine is the first bill that's that's starting to move. It was proposed by Senator Kevin Kelly, who is the uh, leader of the Senate Republicans. And I can only tell you what the concept says, and the concept is. That uh, to implement a strategic plan to reduce the wait time for services, so uh, and a few other things, so it's uh, it could be categorized as a waiting list bill, uh, but there are other waiting list bills. So, um, um, that bill, that bill in public health has was referred to public health, and is uh, the committee today decided that they would draft a more comprehensive bill uh, around that concept. Um, this is the time that voices start to come into the legislature and and people can say well this is what i'd like to do with the waiting list this is my particular situation and this is a situation of other folks um uh house bill 5926 uh was proposed by uh house member mike d'amico who is a it's like kevin kelly a good friend of our population and this bill has been uh, actively supported by the autism community for those who have IQs above the current qualifying limit. So uh, the autism community would like to see DDS services expanded to cover people with autism who don't have uh, a, a uh, an IQ under 70. So, um, that is also in public health. Uh, I think a couple of these that aren't as applicable to everyone. Uh, Senate Bill 208, uh, introduced by Senator Lizzie Seminera, a Republican, I think, that replaced Kevin Whitcoast in the 8th District. Um, and this bill is intends to expand daily access to low cost or free transportation throughout the state for people with disabilities to help them work and have a have a life. Um, the most significant bill is House Bill 5001. Uh, proposed by uh, Speaker Ritter, uh, Majority Leader Rojas, uh, Jillian Gilchrist and Lucy Dathan. Um, um, Julian Gilchrist is a a, um, a leader on the Human Services Committee, and Lucy Dathan is a um, vice chair of the Human Services Committee. It's received six sponsors, and this is to provide support and services for people with intellectual disability by ameliorating the wait list for Medicaid waiver programs and implementing programs to maximize uh, federal support. Um, so, uh, Speaker Woodrow did speak about this bill in, without referring to it by name, 
on the Fox 61 news program, uh, the real story, the Sunday before the um, the Sunday before the session started. And um, what he said in the interview was that uh, last year we dealt with mental health. This year it's time to deal with the waiting list for people with disabilities. So um, never know what, what's going to happen with that, but usually when leadership is involved, uh, things do get a hearing and move forward. Um, just a couple more. Uh, House Bill 5443 proposed by Kevin Ryan, who's a representative, um, referred to human services. And that is to eliminate the uh, clawback of, of, I'll call them excess income that providers have at the end of the year. So if a provider gets paid to provide a service and they perform the service for less money, in most cases, there's a settlement with the state and uh, the provider has to return the excess funds. Um, I'll use excess in quotes. Um, um house bill 5445 uh proposed by representative ryan and senator austin another leader who also is a good friend of our community uh she's there proposing an act eliminating administrative burdens for health and human services providers and the last one is house bill 5446 uh also proposed by representative ryan and kathy austin and that's an act indexing state funding for nonprofit services. So um, for those who have followed our movement for a long time, uh, providers and families have complained that rates don't change every year. Uh, rates, um, there have been a few increases over time and going in the early 90s, there were actually two years of decreases. Uh, when the state was in severe budget problems. So um, this bill would put into statute an index system so that rates would pretty much automatically go up year to year as the cost of living goes up. Uh, the state and DDS, the legislature, the governor and the state have been uh, working on the wage problem for a long time. Uh, the last several years, we have gotten new money to increase wages of, of our workers in the private sector. Uh, I think this year it will go to $17.50 or $18 an hour as a minimum starting July 1st. Uh, that doesn't mean it's enough. Uh, there are other costs that have gone up that providers aren't getting a, a cost of living increase for. And so uh, providers would like to be able to plan that when they do something, if their cost of providing a service goes up by uh, because of the cost of gasoline or insurance or health insurance, that they will get an increase to cover that. So uh, that's the legislative update. Uh, we have new situation this year. We have a group for the 30 years I've been doing this. Um, there's always been, we don't have any money. And the state now has money. Um, that doesn't mean it will be allocated to serve our population, uh, but everyone is asking. And so if everyone is asking, we should be asking as well, whether it's for the wait list or for uh, better rates for providers or what have you. Um, uh, so that's one new thing. Another new thing is, it looks like we won't have COVID restrictions at the Capitol this year. So uh, for the last couple of years, all of the public hearings were done only on Zoom. Uh, so um, you could still testify about a bill. You could testify at the budget when the appropriations hearings come up, but um, it was much different doing it on Zoom and not having the 
one-on-one -on -one contact with legislators. That looks like it'll be lifted this year. Um, and public hearings will be back on a hybrid basis, so you can go in person or you can testify on Zoom. Um, the third thing that's changed is we have uh, different chairs of the two most significant committees. Uh, appropriations is staying the same uh, on the Democratic side, but uh, there are new leaders on the Republican side in the House and the Senate. Uh, the Human Services Committee has new leadership, uh, and that's where some of anything related to Medicaid typically goes to the Human Services Committee. And the Public Health Committee has pretty much new leadership. Uh, Saad Anwar, Senator from South Windsor, is back, but he took over mid-year last year. Uh, and uh, there's a new leader from the House. So uh, there are a lot of legislators that have left. We're going to have to educate all these folks all over again. And um, I think I'd say the last new thing is, you know, uh, Commissioner Commissioner Schaff has been renominated to to continue in his role for another for the uh, second Lamont term, uh, but we have a new DSS commissioner uh, subject to confirmation, and her name is Andrea Barton Reeves. And for about eight years, she was at Hark. About five of those years, she was the CEO at Hark. So you have someone is the head of the Medicaid agency, which is involved in a lot of things that we deal with, um, that that perhaps has a different understanding of, of what providers and families go through. I know Andrea, she's a great person and um, we'll have to see how it goes, but um, uh, Deidre Gifford did a great job, but um, she didn't have the direct experience that Andrea has. So hopefully things will be better. So that's the legislative update. Um, for now and um, watch your email. The advocacy groups I'm sure will be forwarding information about public hearings. As they come up, uh, those will be happening in February and early March. Uh, but they are only given with short notice, so usually you only have two or three days short notice notice uh, from the time it's announced till the time it actually happens. So uh, we're hoping that Kevin Bronson and his new deputy, uh, whose first name I forget, her name is, last name is Kennedy. Uh, will be resuming the updates that Ron O'Connor used to give uh, to everyone uh, during the session. Um, Kevin came to our group, I think, last year to, to talk about uh, his role in the legislative and communications area over at Central Office. So, uh, Ellen? We actually um, do. I had a meeting last night. It was very... And, and we will so be, we didn't we talk, talk about, about the, the the legislative meeting last night, but we, he will be sending out an email, I believe. He's usually good about that. Uh, who's that, Walter? Varian. What's his last name? Varian Salters. Yes. Oh, Varian Salters, okay. Yeah. yeah, so the self-advocates group. Yeah, yeah. and so, it's no, called the Rock and Roll, good, uh, Rock and Roll very good at something. That stuff out. He's very good about that. Yeah, so um, that'll be good. Um, and we have Susan has thing. her hand raised. Yeah, I, I can't see who the hand raised is. Susan. Susan? Su Susan? Yes. Yeah, I have a question. Could you go back to 5445 are you saying that well, what i heard was that if there is excess money that was set, provide that was given to providers at the end of the year if they didn't spend it then the, it's not that the providers give that money back to dss 
or the state that there's a negotiation uh, for a settlement with DDS. And and I, I just want to, if you could just repeat what you said regarding what the new, what the proposal is for that money. The proposal is that the uh, provider would be allowed to keep the money. Uh, so, now, okay. I can't think of too many agencies that underspend. Usually it's the other problem. Uh, the cost of providing the service is is more than uh, what is funded and is met through other sources, be it uh, grants or uh, reserve funds that the agency has. So. Um, and, and, and who, which, and is that a Senate bill or a? Because um, that's a huge incentive to not spend money where it's designated to go. Well, I think it's designed to allow organizations that are efficient to not be penalized. Uh, I understand your point. Um, I've never been involved in, in the settlement process, uh, although I served as chair of an agency for uh four years and was on the board for over 15 years all i know is that the settlements happened and uh, stacy i don't know if you can provide any clarification on that um as to how se how settlements work um i th i think you you explained it well um brick um about the the cost settlements that agencies um face at times um you know, we used to do 100% yeah. and then um, there was a, a percentage, um, but I don't think that, you know, in my experience that it affected the quality of the services that providers have, um, you know, um, been able to provide to individuals. Um, sometimes if they had an excess, they would use that to um, make improvements on their homes, mm -hmm. to be honest, and, and update equipment and things of that nature. Yeah, so, um, so this would remove that. And again, I don't think you see uh, uh, any kind of major underspend. Um, and that was a House bill, um, 5443, introduced by Kevin Ryan, who's an experienced um, a uh, legislator in dealing with our folks, and uh, that's currently at the uh, Human Services Committee. Thank you. So, um, any other questions about that? Um, I just had a comment. Yeah. Um, I know um, Ellen is supported through Mark of Manchester, and I was on their board. And there were years when money, there was money they didn't spend and they had to give it back. And having been on the board, um, it's it's really quite upsetting that money has to then be returned to the state when it really could be used by the agency. Maybe, like you say, Stacy, to update a home or to have it be used for that nonprofit um, so, and I, I, this has been going on, I believe for years, so I don't think it's, it's anything new, but it would be nice to be able to then use that money. Um, it's like found money. Oh, wow. We can finally do this. Um, yeah. Well, um, uh, what I remember about cost settlement goes back to the late eighties, early nineties, which it was a hundred percent settlement in those days. And, um, Ed Hark, our financial director, uh, who kept a very precise set of books and was kept the board and management very well informed, he would identify possible surplus uh, by the 1st of June. And we would identify during, uh, during late May and early June uh, what had to be spent in order to to even out and um, we came up with uh, one time salary um, compensation increases for uh, for staff and other qualified expenses. So um, and you know I haven't been in that role for almost 30 years so I don't know how uh, 
agencies deal with it today. Uh, and it's not 100% anymore. So there is a split incentive uh, that we're, we're funding you to do this. Uh, to, uh, we want you to be as efficient as possible, but provide the quality service. And if you're efficient, we're not going to take it all away. So, um, you know, we'll have to see where that goes. If it goes anywhere. And again, there are hundreds and hundreds of bills every year, particularly during the long session, that there are concepts and they don't go anywhere. Uh, if there are a number of bills, like on the waiting list, there are several bills. Uh, typically, those concepts get combined together and result in one piece of proposed legislation. So they usually have a joint public hearing for all, all of those waiting list bills, and they come up with something that that um, considers the the uh, comments from the public hearing and uh, the fiscal folks too. So anyway, um, so that's that's legislation. Um, uh, it's a lot to track, and so I'll be tracking it. Hopefully, uh, we'll get some support from Kevin, and uh, I don't recall her first name, and she's not on the website yet. I think it's Diane Kennedy. Uh, she came over from uh, DPH uh, in a similar role. So um, it's hard to replace Rod O'Connor. And there was some joking at the last council meeting that Rod has been handcuffed to his desk and we might give him the key to unlock himself to retire. But um, he's been doing it a long, long time. So um, anyway, what do we have next? They seen the regional director's update. OK. OK, um, good evening, everyone. Um, I have a few updates. Um, unfortunately, our in person family and individual forums are um, canceled, you know, due to uh, just being cautious in regards to uh, the COVID numbers out there. So they will be replaced with virtual meetings. So the North region um, virtual uh, virtual meeting is scheduled for February 1st, and that will be from 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. So our North Region meeting, virtual meeting, will be February 1st, 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. And registration is required, um, so they uh, know how many uh, people to expect. Um, and you can you can do that on our our website. Um, also. Uh, this year, the Deputy Commissioner, Lisa Villardo, will be continuing to facilitate our fourth Tuesday forums, uh, 3 p.m. to 4.30 p.m. And I hope that uh, you have had the opportunity to look at some of the ones that we've had this past um, year because they have been very um, great and informative. Um, during this past year, we've had um, forums on assistive technology, remote supports, and community companion homes. And these were, you know, extremely exciting for me to watch um, because we heard the, the views of individuals receiving services from providers, providers speaking, and, um, and also families, um, you know, discussing how they felt about uh, using these type of services to serve their individuals. So, um, I, I just, you know, I urge all of you that if you um, have the opportunity um, to go online because they are recorded. So if you're not able to join while it's live on the fourth Tuesdays from three to four, you also can go and watch the recordings. And um, I, I just encourage you to share that information because especially when some people are on the fence about certain services or don't have um, enough information to make a decision for um, their loved one, this this really honestly will will help you to to see the services for what they they truly are and what they mean to people and what uh, benefits they are to others. Uh, so again, we have families that speak, we have individuals that speak, um, 
and the providers and then professionals from DDS to also explain to you about the services. And, um, it's, and it's an opportunity if you're able to join live, you're able to ask questions and, and get responses uh, there. Um, so uh, again, I encourage that. Uh, I could give you some of uh, information for the upcoming um, forums that are scheduled. Uh, January 24th is the next one, and that will be on self-directed services. Um, February 28th, we have residential transformation where they will discuss um, housing and how the um, American Rescue Plan Act, the ARPA money will um, assist in this area. Um, March 28th, it's about employment transformation. And again, how ARPA is going to help to um, assist in, in this you know, journey that we're on with the transforming services. Uh, April 25th, we're having technology for optimal independence. And uh, May 23rd is ind individual and family supports and the respite services uh, that we provide. Um, so, you know, you could go on our website and uh, click to join any of these um, forums that we're, we're having. And if there's any topics that you uh, want to see covered, uh, please feel comfortable to uh, share that information um, with myself. I will pass that information on to Elisa uh, Villardo, our deputy commissioner, who is in charge of facilitating these uh, forums. And, and like I said, they've been a pleasure to, to watch. Um, <clears throat> we do have a spot on our website that you can subscribe to email updates and you can actually choose what notifications in what areas that you would like to get more information. So I definitely encourage that uh, you get the latest and greatest um, uh, information and then just having the option of being able to choose what areas you want more information that helps you so that you don't get inundated with well, you know, well, a lot of whole emails that you don't have interest in. Um, so if you can take a look at that, um, it'll, you know, there's a little area that says subscribe um, to e-updates. Um, the ARPA uh, initiatives were encouraging agencies to develop plans to submit to DDS in regards to how they can um, um, transform their services in order to, you know, serve more people and also to help people uh, be able to um, participate in more independent uh, types of services. And so it's a, it's a really exciting time right now. Um, we're, we have a review committee within the North region that will review these plans as the agency submits them and, you know, just to review them to see if you know, how feasible they are and just to provide our input as well. Um, so stay tuned. I hope to have more information on that. Um, Hi, it's it's Lori. I, I am actually on the um, the residential transformation committee. And um, I can speak on that for, for just a moment. It's really Great. a lot of good things are happening. Um, the, the whole gist of it is really to um, look at the group homes and the CLAs and the CRSs and um, look at individuals that may be able to be served um, more independently in their own apartment with assistive technology and remote services. And, and there are individuals that maybe 15 or 20 years ago, there was an emergency family situation. Um, there were no remote services at the time um and they were put in crs's or clas um so the agencies will be looking at those particular individuals um and of course the families have to be on board and the consumer has to want this as well um to move out of that setting into an apartment setting um and i think it's very exciting because it's going to free up um monies that will be able to address more more individuals on the wait list. I mean, there'll there'll always be a need for CRSs and CLAs because there will always be individuals who need you know, 24 hour services. Um, but there are many individuals right now that can possibly move toward 
to a more independent setting and may not need the congregate setting. Um, so it's it's exciting. The agencies are putting their proposals in. There is an incentive for the agencies as well. Um, and again, it's something that the parents are involved in and the parents would want as well as the consumer would want. Um, and assessments would be set up as well um, to look at those particular consumers and um, do remote um, assessments, uh, assistive technology while still in the group home um, to determine what would be feasible or what would be appropriate for that individual. Um, so I think it's I think it's really, really cool and it's moving in the right direction to better serve everyone. Absolutely. Thank you for that, Lori. Um, I, I do want to share that the North region, we've been um, really, really excited to uh, work with providers who are participating with developers to have cluster developments um, and they're in the community, they're integrated. Um, so, you know, we've we've heard that, you know, Favar, we have has opened their Bear Woods in Avon. Uh, they also opened their second location, uh, Lavender Fields in Bloomfield, mm -hmm. um, and both of those locations have been doing um, great. Uh, the next location that's opening uh, in the process of they they just received their um, their certification of occupancy is uh, Cry um, is working with um, they have a, a, a development in West Hartford on New Park Avenue, um, so that is extremely you know really exciting um, as well. And I could tell you that there's um, four others in in the works for us. So, so North Region has been really, really busy working with um, providers and developers in in creating these opportunities. Um, the additional four that will be coming uh, soon will be um, Favar's working on another one um, on 80 South Street in Farmington. And CCRC is working on a development also in, in New Britain. Um, it's going to be underway. Uh, we have uh, a development on off of Asylum Avenue. It's like closer to um, a private school near University of Hartford. Mm -hmm. uh, Turning Leaf is working with a, a developer um, named Rio. That's in Hartford. And Mark. Um, Incorporated is working with Metro Realty, Realty to develop something in South Windsor. So we're we're really you know working very collaboratively with the the uh, providers and the developers. We um, make sure that we meet on a regular basis to to keep up to date on how things are moving along. And of course, you know we we always love to have projected uh, target dates, but um, you know um, these. Things happen and, you know, the punch list don't get completed as quick as we would like them to. So um, it's hard to really give you a, a um, concrete date of when everything will come to uh, total, you know, completion. But again, it's just been a very exciting time uh, for individuals to have this opportunity to, um, you know, live in a cluster and be supported by a, a designated agency and um, be independent, um, as independent as they can be with using, you know, remote supports. And uh, we, uh, like for the CRY development, they have induction stoves that, you know, make it safer for individuals to cook on their own when they, when they want to. Um, so. Um, it's it's exciting. It's been busy, a bit, lot of busy work, but exciting. Lori? Yeah, uh, this is Rick Rothstein. These oh. used to be referred to as IDASH projects, which um, IDASH was a particular type of funding that came from the federal and state government uh, that was limited and was used up on, on the two Favor projects and a HARC project on Asylum Avenue. Oh, right. Uh, yes. In downtown Hartford. And so since then, uh, uh, DDS has been working with the Department of Housing and private developers and looking at projects that were, are, are already being planned to see if we can carve out a space for our folks and to give them opportunity uh, to live in the community uh, as independently as possible. Mm -hmm. uh, um, um, couple of other things on ARPA. Uh, 
what is the format of the February 1st meeting going to be like? Uh, do you know how that's well, going to work? It will be uh, the commissioner and the uh, regional leadership. And just, you know, give an overview of uh, update on ARPA and also just answering questions from individuals and families. OK, and um, I hope this is a situation where uh, there's transparency between the providers, DDS and the families so that um, families know that the providers are getting incentives to do this. And it is in the interest if someone decides to do it, it's in the interest of the individual and the family. And it's in the interest of the provider and in the interest of DDS. So um, uh, hopefully that that's going to be the case. Um, I have watched some of the ARPA meetings and uh, uh, the ones that are already re that they're 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 stream live like our meeting is, and they're also recorded. Although there's some delay in getting them posted, and um, there are actually uh, five committees dealing with ARPA. There's an overall ARPA advisory committee uh, there, and there are four subcommittees. Uh, we're fortunate to have Lori on one of them, the residential committee. There's also a day transformation committee, and um, there are two engagement committees. Uh, the DDS engagement committee is, is working on communication to uh, caseworkers and everyone else inside DDS as to what our service offerings are and and how ARPA will improve the number of choices um, available to folks. The uh, There's also a family and individual communication uh, uh, committee and that committee is working on the same thing only to folks like us and to our family members. Uh, and then there's uh, the ARPA Advisory Committee kind of coordinates everything. Uh, Peter Mason, the former Deputy Commissioner, is coordinating the whole project. And uh, we are going to start seeing uh, communications. Uh, actually, we've started, some of us have started to receive communications about um, some parts of the project. Um, everyone who's in a congregate setting right now will receive if they have not already received a survey that asks a number of questions that are being uh, tabulated by an outside vendor on a no name basis. Uh, you uh, you fill out the questionnaire. There are, it only takes a few minutes to fill out. And it talks about uh, would you be willing to consider a more independent setting and uh, what do you know about this uh, about the uh, ARPA moving on project. The moving on project is the transformation piece of ARPA. There are lots of other pieces of ARPA, like a new case management system mm -hmm. and uh, a technology technology focus and a half a dozen other things that are one mm -hmm. part of ARPA. The other part is this moving on project, which is to help people look at other options and educate folks that not everybody is suited for a group home and group homes aren't suited for, for everyone that um, there are other opportunities that uh, people can uh, take advantage of and and help provide opportunities for others as well so um Lori has a question um yes yes Thank you, Rick. Um, back to the four sites that are being in the process of being developed in the, the Hartford area. Are are they all IDASH programs? Uh, um, they're no, Actually, they're, none well, of them are IDASH projects. Not, okay, uh, yeah, that's what I, uh, I thought. No, I those heard. are clustered. We call them clustered clusters. Yeah, the okay. the engagement committees are working on common definitions because. Everybody calls them something else. It, at a recent meeting, uh, there was a lot of debate over um, in-home supports. Uh, the definition of in-home supports. Does in-home supports include a cluster development like the IDASH projects? Um, in a sense, it is. In a sense, it isn't. Uh, 
uh, people are living in their own home, they're living in an apartment, and they have people coming in to help them. Uh, in many respects, no different than if they were still living at home and somebody was coming in to help them at home, right. or if they okay. lived in an unattached apartment. So um, the um, the in, the in, two engagement committees need to come up with some common uh, uh, common terminology uh, so that if it's cluster development, mm -hmm. everyone knows what a cluster development is. Um, mm -hmm. And um, I tell you right now, people don't necessarily know what it is. Okay. Lori, I, uh, I, 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 yes, you answered my question. I just, I had heard that there were no more I dash projects. Yeah. I didn't know if that was the case. And then when you mentioned the cluster and the new sites going up in these four communities, I was, I was confused. I, I, they, they sounded like the I dash program which is also cluster. So um, I think you clarified that for me. Um, thank you. Yeah, so um, um, not everyone has the time that I do. Uh, but <laughs> if you have a chance uh, or is willing to commit that much time to it. Uh, the uh, ARPA meetings are interesting uh, and uh, there is a lot of care being given to figure out how best to communicate the message and uh, if you have received a survey, everyone who is in congregate setting now should have received it. They were sent out bulk rate mail by the contractor, I guess. So uh, if you're in a CLA or CRS, you should be getting one. Uh, fill it out by the end of the month and send it in. And um, uh, that will give the department a better idea of what people's attitudes are and and know perhaps what they need to focus on in terms of communication uh, to bring families along. Cynthia? Yeah. Cynthia? You're on mute, Cynthia. Can you hear me now? Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, which agency is developing uh, the South Windsor site? Was it Brio or it's Mark? Mark. Oh, oh, Mark is doing the yeah. South Windsor site. Oh, okay, great. Yeah, Thank you very much. Agency. Thank you. So, um, I only had one more thing to share. Okay, go ahead. Um, there's a notice of opportunity that has been issued for individuals living with their families or independently with in home supports. Um, it's an assistive technology grant, and these grants will um, assist with uh, purchasing, you know, technology, have an assessment, doing trainings, um, environmental modifications if needed, um, uh, internet assistance with internet, but with a $50 cap per month. Um, and the uh, awardees that individuals that receive this award will be expected to participate in like a follow up survey just to give us feedback on how um, everything is uh, working and what the impact was mm, uh, of you know receiving this uh, grant money. And so there's currently open enrollment and I uh, placed in the, the comments um, the link to uh, that information. There's a uh, FAQs in there and 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 the application, uh, the criteria for the application, and so it's open enrollment right now. But May first is the deadline for all equipment to have to be purchased and installed and um, services in place. And that's all I have. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um... I did ask for an, two additional items to be added to the agenda. One of those is a report from the Council on Developmental Services uh, on which I serve. And uh, uh, we had our election of officers for the new year. Uh, Kevin Zingler from Mark has returned as our chair. Uh, one of our prior chairs has returned as vice chair and I have returned as secretary. Originally, we planned to keep the same officers, 
but one of our um, our vice chair from last year was replaced. And so since she's no longer a member, she's no longer eligible to be vice chair. Um, um, we are our, our principal activity has been to to continue to look at the abuse and neglect issue. Uh, I'm serving with. Um, I guess four other members of the council uh, to look at the abuse and neglect uh, reporting systems and communication systems to see how we can um, within current law. Try to improve things. Um, we have received one product back from the from DDS that we'll be looking at this week, uh, which is something that was recommended by us and by uh, DDS. And uh, that is sort of a roadmap. Is that if your child has a uh, or a family member has an abuse or neglect case, where is it being handled, and what is it that you can do to find out what's happening? Um, there currently isn't a lot of information um, on the DDS website, and there's no handbook that you get if something happens. And uh, that is the first thing that, that we've looked at, and, and hopefully we can wrap that up soon. Uh, we are continuing to interview um, uh, various officials in DDS, including uh, legal counsel uh, and the um, the king of statistics, Josh Lalore, is going to be meeting with us to see uh, what kind of data is available that could be made available to the council or to the public uh, on how many investigations there are, uh, how, how long they take to be resolved, and things that are decided what we're going to ask them to provide. We're, we're going to start with what data do you have? And uh, what kind of reports already exist that might be able to um, clarify things a bit? And um, uh, we're hoping we can make steps in a positive direction uh, administratively and, and open the door a little bit for families to know what's going on in their cases. Uh, many people, um, I had a friend of mine uh, I talked to about a week ago, and she didn't know what I was working on, and uh, she told me about a case in another region, uh, so we can all uh, breathe a little easier, where her son had fallen four times in a month, and four times went to the emergency room for stitches to his head. And I said to her, I said, did you file a, a was it certainly there were incident reports. Uh, was there a neglect case filed? Uh, and she said, I don't know. Uh, I said, well, you need to find out because that certainly is something that should be looked at. Um, and um, I, I will be talking to her tomorrow, so hopefully uh, there's an update. So um, that's what we're up to. Um, we haven't decided on a legislative breakfast this year. We've done that uh, three years ago and two years ago. Uh, I don't know that there'll be support for it this year because there is marginal benefit from having the council meet with legislators you know, in, in a one time session. Uh, I'm certainly a believer in getting in front of your legislator and being on a first name basis with them. And you can't do that in a one time uh, group session at the Capitol. Get to know your legislator and let them know where you are and what's happening. And um, they can in turn help you perhaps in in an immediate case, but also uh, we do need the votes for for whatever changes come down the line. So. Um, as the public hearings happen, feel free to speak up and uh, I'll, I'll try to make sure that you guys know about them. So on the, on the only other thing I was going to bring up was the election of officers. I did agree 
to serve on an interim basis until January. Um, perhaps we should give them notice to folks before we actually have an election. Um, I have no problem continuing to be a participant on, on the rack, uh, but I do think it's probably time to, to bring somebody else into leadership. And uh, so think about it amongst yourselves and the other members, and perhaps we can have the election next month. Uh, there's no gavel to pass. There's no, uh, I might consider passing the, um, the red um, replay um, um, flag that I mentioned a few months ago, but um, those are available on Amazon and typically our group stays in line, so we don't really need that, but I'm carrying it with me to the legislature when I go. Though. So uh, yeah, don't say that. You told us six months ago that, or last week that this is what you said. Here's the replay flag. So um, anyway, I hope everyone is well and does well and your family members are doing well. And uh, if any of you have questions during the month, feel free to reach out to me at any time. You have my email address and and hopefully uh, all the groups can work together. Uh, this is the first year so far that I am not involved in any of these legislative uh, initiatives. Um, I would like to know more about them before getting involved and um, and uh, when things start to percolate, I will probably jump in, but not there yet. So anyway, is there a motion to adjourn? Motion. Does anybody have any other business? Let's start with that. Is there a motion to adjourn? Okay, Kim. Uh, yeah, a motion to adjourn. Yeah. Um, all in favor? All opposed? All right. Uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Stacy. Uh, look you, forward Richard. to all seeing you on September and February first, and hopefully everyone that has a survey will return it so that we have the best data. Uh, 